Good morning, everybody. It's Midnight and Beyond, welcoming you back to the world of Professor Layton in the Diabolical Box. In the last episode, we explored the Molentary Express, and I'm going to have a hard time remembering that name. But in this episode, we are going to begin our investigation now that we got a good scope of the train and where we'll be staying for the majority of our adventure. The entire thing doesn't take place on the train, of course, because we're actually going to a destination, but it's still a place we'll be returning to uh, every now and again. But now that's taken care of, let's go ahead and examine the elephants in the room. This paper. Look at that. Someone left rubbish on the deck here. Can you believe that? Some people have the worst manners. Listen here, Luke. A true gentleman cleans up after himself and others, should the need arise. What do you say we take care of this mess? Puzzle number 22. Taking out the trash. Oh god, here we go, our first of many sliding puzzles. Anyone who's played the Professor Lane games know that sliding puzzles are the bane of everyone's existence. They are pure stinking evil, and they are the closest thing you'll get to any sort of ultimate, ultimate boss in this franchise. They are stinking evil. Uh, for this one, I'm just going to go ahead and read the description, give you the hints, but in the future I might not read the hints, I'll just show them off on the side. Actually, I probably will show them off on the side, just as well, just so we could get things started. Put that garbage into the trash where it belongs. Using your stylus, move the blocks obstructing your path and slide the clump of garbage all the way to the can at the bottom of the screen. The hints uh, basically just give you the few first steps, or the first few steps, so don't really need to go over them. I'm just gonna go ahead and um, tell you what you need to do. So first off, we are going to bring this blue block down into the trash along with this other blue block over here. And you're gonna wanna bring this over here so we can create a big old stack of them. Bring this yellow block over here. Uh, bring this over this away. So now we have an opportunity to move a blue block into this little section so we could get it out of our way. And then this one could get brought up here. A uh, yellow block could get brought right over here. Uh, we're going to want to put the blue one right here so we could bring this yellow one down. And up next, we're going to go bring this yellow one right here. Drag the garbage block all the way down. Now it sounds like I'm playing Tetris Attack or something. Uh, bring this up here. Uh, what do we want to do now? Now we're going to want to bring the garbage block back up. Just so we could do a little finagling. And I'm going to bring this one up here. Bring this yellow block right over this way. Bring this down. Uh, bring this one down so we could open up a pathway for the gar garbage block. Right, Once again, the garbage block. Uh, this one right up here. And then you can just go ahead and bring all these things over here. And as for the final blue block right there, I'm just going to keep it down there for now. Put that right there. Uh, bring the blue one up here. Uh, raise this yellow block at the garbage block, then this blue block over here, and you are good to go. The first sliding puzzle takes 29 moves minimum. And there we have it. Aw, oh, spick and span. I thought it was epic for a second. If you really know how to work it, you could complete this puzzle in as few as 29 moves. Oh, and don't forget, trash belongs in a trash can, not out on the street or on the deck of a train. There, now there's no trash cluttering up that amazing view. Wonderful, isn't it? Keeping a place neatly, uh, neat really brightens it up. Oh boy, sliding puzzles are pure stinking evil, and I know like, I don't have much to complain about because I'm uh, going to be looking at the guides, but my god, playing this for the first time, it was stinking torture. Uh, this guy looks very funny. Ah, there's nothing like travel by rail to put a spring in your step. I couldn't agree more. And there's no better way to do it than on a train as fine as yours, Mr. Beluga. Hmm, so you know my name, do you? But of course, this train and its owner have quite a reputation in London. 
I've seen your face in the papers more than a few times. Ho oh, ho, is that so now? I'm sorry, uh, my friend, but I can't say I know you as well as you seem to know me. The name is Herschel Leighton. I'm a professor of archaeology by trade, but a train enthusiast on the side. How convenient. I've heard tales of this train's grandeur, so I decided it was time to experience it, firsthand. Well, isn't that something? It certainly is a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Leighton, was it? Oh my, just look at how late it's gotten. I really have to run. Do enjoy your time aboard. How late it's got in. So we get to meet the owner of the train, which is nice. Uh, any other cars we go into, we could still go into this one, but there's no one to be seen. Just hop on out. I guess we're just going to make our way back to uh, our room, I suppose. We're just going to be backtracking, it seems. Why don't we head back to the dining car now, Luke? I've worked up quite an appetite. You said you didn't want any snacks from the lady before. Now that she's gone, you're like, oh, I want, like, the good stuff now. I don't really get it. The professor and Luke decide to visit the dining car a second time. I really don't know why that's necessary, but whatever. Uh, she's here. She doesn't have anything for us. Just gonna skip through here. Uh, can't we go in here quite yet. I don't know why we need to wait for someone to be in this room before going in when we went to the other room. Uh, rooms when nobody was around. Welcome back, sirs. My deepest apologies for the long wait. Let me show you to your seats. All right, it's finally time to eat. My sentiments exactly. Wow, look at all these choices. It's enough to make my head spin. Oh, look over there. There's some sort of commotion going on. You call this hard to cuisine? I call it slop. You are saying we actually serve this to our customers? I'll make remake it right away, sir. Hey, get that mess out of my sight this instant. But of course, I, I'm very sorry you have displeased you so. And another thing, look at these vases in that picture. Utterly tacky. Replace them immediately. But sir, that piece is a quintessential work by the world-renowned I don't care if the Queen of England painted it. Replace it and be quick about it. Yes, of course, sir. I'll start making the arrangements at once. Hey, it's that same man we saw earlier. I don't think I've ever seen anyone so bossy and loud. That would be Mr. Beluga, I believe. It's too bad that the picture wasn't to his taste. I think it's marvelous. Ah, and speaking of pictures, Luke, have I got a puzzle for you. Puzzle number 10, a work of art. Uh. The drawing below is made up of curved lines that intersect to create sections. If you want to color in the entire canvas so that no section touches the side of a section with the same color, what's the fewest number of colors you could use? You could use a color as many times as you want as long as it doesn't touch that area with the same color. Once you have your answer, tap the input answer icon and enter the number of colors. Hint number one, there's no trick here. You might have an easier time if you mark your drawing by using the memo function. Even though you can only draw in black with the memo function, so it's kinda useless. Okay. Hint number two, why don't you take a closer look at the corners of the picture? That's a bit better. Hint number three, you could complete most of the drawing using only two colors, but did you notice there's one pesky area down in the lower left corner that requires an additional color? Uh, maybe? I don't know. The solution, though, is that you'll need a minimum of three different colors to fill in this drawing. Just leave it to me. Cake. That's right, you'll need three colors to fill in the drawing. Most of the drawing can be done with two colors, but one pesky area in the lower left corner requires a third color to complete. Expertly solved, Luke. After a puzzle like that and a lovely meal, I could use a break. Let's head back to our room. Sounds good. Hello there, sorry to interrupt your game, but there's something important you should know. 
As you progress through the story, some puzzles will disappear from the original locations. These puzzles are then moved to Granny Riddleton's shack, where you can solve them when you want. Okay then, here's the first set of puzzles to be sent to the shack. If no puzzles appear on the next screen, it means that there are no unsolved puzzles to send right now. Hooray! No puzzles sent to Granny Riddleton's shack, so that means we haven't missed any. That's crazy, I think we could have missed some already. The professor and Luke decide to return to their room in card three. Uh, hey, good to check things out right there. So we already got another puzzle for the butler, or from the butler, rather. Go ahead and do that. Puzzle number eight, Luke's Big Dinner. Now, Luke, are you sure you could really eat all of that? You put in quite an order there. No sweat, Professor. I'll clean my plate and still have room for more. It's no wonder the Professor is concerned, as Luke's order cost twice what the Professor's did. Below, you could see all the items Luke and Professor Layton ordered, as well as the price of each item. Touch the price for each of the items that are part of Luke's order. Hint number one. Start by adding up the cost of the entire meal. Hint number two. Luke's meal costs twice as much as Professor's. That means the ratio of Luke's cost compared to the Professor's cost must be a 2 1. Hint number 3. The cost of the entire meal comes out to 105 pounds. The, this total needs to be split to fit our ratio of 2 to 1. Therefore, Luke's meal costs 70 pounds and the Professor's cost 35. What combination of food and drink items can you find that add up to 70? The solution is that Luke ordered some spaghetti. Uh, I can't circle it. Do I just like? Do I submit? Wait, excuse me. You should do the trick. Um. Ah, uh, well, I suppose you can't win them all. It wasn't letting me circle them. Like I didn't understand. Like, well, I'm gonna hashtag reset because that's not fair. <laughs> Okay, let's try this again. I don't know what happened. It's that you need to tap the number. Instead of like tapping the food item or circling it like we've been doing, you have to tap the number, which is dumb. So what did Luke stink in order? Like spend so much stinking money. Uh, he got a whole stinking pot of spaghetti, which costs 16 pounds. Um, uh, that would like, and all things considered, that's a good deal, but a 12 pound milkshake, that is kind of ridiculous. Uh, 17 pounds for whatever this thing is. And then 25 pounds for whatever this jank is. This should do the trick. Where the heck does he put it all? I will never know. And I had to go ahead and do the oh, garbage puzzle wonderful. again, which is really annoying, but whatever. Good work. If you calculate the total tab, you'll see that meal costs 105 pounds. Knowing the total, Luca must have ordered 70 pounds worth of food and the professor 35. Once you've got those numbers, the rest is easy. Are you sure you didn't order too much? Nope, this stew is great and the steaks chomp great too. Well then, eat up I suppose. Luke is living the life of luxury. Goodness, you must possess quite the intellect to solve a puzzle that, like that so easily. Now, as we have some time in our next destination, I invite you to sit back and enjoy the ride. It's kind of dumb that they let you submit when you don't even have anything selected, but then again, sometimes nothing is the answer, so I guess it's not completely out of the question that they would do that. No doubt about it, the Molendary Express is the last word in luxury. Even the crystal is first class. I'll say, look at this glass. Yes, its etching is quite impressive. Oh, and speaking of glasses, have you heard this one, Luke? Puzzle number nine, stacked glasses. The owner of a four-star restaurant assigns a young waiter the task of stacking glasses in a decorative way. Eager to please, the young waiter immediately draws the five separate designs and shows them to the owner. The owner takes one glance at the designs and, with a look of irritation, turns to the boy and cries, This design is preposterous. What were you thinking? Which of the five designs is the owner talking about? Kind of rude that he would just insult one of the designs and then uh not even say that the other ones are okay hint number one this design is preposterous the owner wasn't angry because the design in question was hard to assemble 
He was upset because the one design was physically impossible to replicate in real life. Hint number two, A and C could probably be pulled off with steady hands and a lot of patience. Hint number three, one design while perfectly natural when drawn in 2D stacks the glasses in a way that is impossible to create in reality. On paper, each cup is represented by a single bent line, but real glasses have a rim on the top of the walls of a set thickness. The solution is that layout D is outright impossible to create in real life. Just leave it to me. Maiden's apprentice strikes again. If you notice that, uh, well, the bottom cup is kind of ridiculous looking, but because the two edges are going inwards of it, but then also, uh, you see, like the top one wouldn't go completely in, but it would still slide into the cup. You would assume. I don't even know, but it's D. That's all we need to know. Nicely done, Luke. Now let's move away from the glass, shall we? It'd be all too easy to break it. Now that's taken care of. I feel like we should be able to examine this guy right here. He just stands out a lot more than everyone else. Uh, is this guy. This guy does have a puzzle for us. Kind of just went in here by accident, but seems it was good to do that. That was bad even for Mr. Beluga. You mean he always blows up at you like that? Well, you know me or someone else on the staff. The boss could be real hard to please. That's awful. You guys shouldn't have to put up with him bullying you like that. Well, the boss does have a point. After all, he made this railway what it is. He always says that a first-class train deserves a first-class atmosphere. Heck, even the plates we used in the dining car are special order. The worksmanship is amazing. Check out the details on the back. Oh my god, he has custom-made plates with their own puzzles. It's amazing. Puzzle number 13 on your plate. The plate in front of you bears a mark made up of two nesting equilateral triangles. Can you puzzle out how many times bigger the large triangle is when compared to the smaller one? I didn't know puzzle out was like a verb or whatever, but apparently it is. Hint number one. You don't need to do any kind of special calculation here. In fact, all you need is a little intuition. Hint number two. How would things look if you rotated the smaller triangle? Hint number three. By now you've tried visualizing what things would look like if you rotated the triangle around, yes? If you've done that, you should be able to see how many smaller triangles fit in the larger one. Just count them up. The solution is that the large triangle is a four times bigger. Even though they show that for you, you want to draw this one because if you draw this one, Oh, I guess they fixed it a bit from the last game, and that's a really good four. I just want to have both of them on here. I don't think it matters if you put four in this slot or the other one. I'm going to risk it right here just to see if that's the case. Oh, outright won't let you because you got to have like something to spot. That's nice. And unfortunately, we... A nine, and I don't know how that turned into a one. Submit. Just leave it to me. Maiden's apprentice strikes again. That's right. Gosh, you really got an eye for this kind of thing. What exactly do you think Mr. Beluga doesn't like about these plates? You got me there. I guess rich people are just fickle. Maybe the fact that it's a triangle? I don't know. Uh, I guess we're going to head on out of here. People don't usually have two puzzles in a row, so we just go on out. Uh, we can't go this way anymore. Luke, let's stop by our room before we go anywhere else. Sounds good, Professor. Uh, anything around here doesn't look like it. Just gonna go forward. So, once I finish... Okay, I was gonna have free range commentary, but I guess not. Now, where do we have... Now, what do we have here? My boy! My sweet little boy! You've got to do something right this instant! Search the entire train! Madam, please calm down so I can understand the situation. Oh, Inspector Chilmy, I had no idea you were on board. If it isn't Mr. Layton, what are the chances, eh? Well, enough small talk. I have another matter to attend to, namely a missing boy. It seems this woman's child was gotten off to somewhere. I don't suppose you've seen him around. No, I don't believe I've seen any young boys. My little boy wandered off and he hasn't returned yet. I'm simply at my wit's end worrying about him. Gentlemen, 
I demand that you drop whatever it is you're doing and help me find my boy. Her. She's been going on like this from the moment I walked in. I understand your concern, madame. My friend and I will be glad to lend you a hand in your search. We'll have the best chance of recovering the boy if we set out searching immediately. Yes, that's exactly what I just said. Now go find my boy already. Tell him mommy's worried about him. It seems the only clues we have to go on are this shoe the tyke left behind and his name Tom. I've tried to squeeze more details from the woman, but it's useless. She just keeps demanding I search the entire tray. How very convenient. That's a ridiculously small shoe. I like how Luke was like so shocked at it. He was like, oh, this is one of Tom's shoes? It's positively tiny, isn't it? Yes, I find it quite curious myself, Luke. It's not Curious Village anymore. It should be quite dull up diabolical. What's strange is that I don't think most children with feet that size can even walk yet. Hmm. Yeah, Tom's shoe. You can find items you pick up in the professor's trunk. Wow, he was apparently so incredibly important that he gets his own section in the mystery section. The professor and Luke decide to help search for Tom, Babette's little boy. Or is it baby? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we just have a shoe on here, just plastered on, and we can't even examine or anything. Kind of weird, but whatever. Uh, but now that's taken care of, I would, I would assume Chummy would have a puzzle for us. Yes, he does. It was certainly a surprise to see you on board, Inspector. May I ask what brings you here? During our investigation, we stumbled upon the late Doctor's diary. Its pages detail the doctor's final days, which led me to this tree. But since the investigation is none of your business, that's all I can tell you, Mr. Layton. Besides, right now, finding that lost child is my top priority. However, since all I have to go on is a shoe with a name, this search will be uphill battle. Luke and I would be glad to offer our assistance in the matter. Oh, I'm sure you would. I've heard about you, Layton. You've got quite the reputation for looking out, for poking your nose into other people's business. But before I let you on my case, show me your famous powers of deduction by solving this puzzle. Puzzle number 20, the shoe store thief. A woman in a shoe store pays the pair of $30 shoes with a $50 bill. Uh, the clerk doesn't have a chance, so he goes to the store shop next door to break the $50 bill. He then gives the woman her change. A while later, the clerk next door comes into the shoe store complaining that the bill she got from the shoe clerk was counterfeit. The mortified shoe clerk gives the other shoe keeper, or shopkeeper a $50 bill of his own in apology. Both the woman with the fake bill and the shoes she took are gone. In total, how much did the shoe store clerk lose in dollars? Hint number one, had the shoe clerk not gone next door to get change, he might never have realized he lost money. Hint number two. In the end, the shoe clerk essentially passed back the $50 he got from the shopkeeper next door, so he neither lost nor gained money from these interactions. Hint number three. The sneaky customer ended up getting away with shoes costing $30 as well as $20 in change. So just spelling it out for you right there in the end, uh, they wound up losing $50, and it's a really crummy five. Or 50 pounds if you're in the UK. Kind of weird that they flip flop back and forth between dollars and pounds, but whatever. Uh, look at the little characters of these guys. They look all so stinking weird. Hmm, it seems your fame isn't entirely undeserved. Nevertheless, this is my case, so I'll be searching for Tom alone. Search on your own if you like, but don't get your hopes up. So, even though he is the real Inspector Chummy this time, the personality is more or less the same from when we initially met him. Which is kind of unfortunate, but whatever. You're just gonna have, we're just gonna have to do our own investigation, whether he likes it or not. Go over here. Uh, you're a new character, and you look incredibly creepy. Excuse me, madame. Have you seen a small boy wandering around here? He would be missing a shoe. 
You can't say I have. I'll certainly remember if I've seen the shoeless little boy. I see. Well, thank you very... Oh, but while we're on the topic of shoes, maybe you could help out with a little predicament of my own. Puzzle number 18, the shoe maze. Here's a maze that's made up of shoes. Your task is to travel from start to goal. You may only travel horizontally or vertically one space at a time, and you must alternate between left and right shoes every step. Also, you may not pass through any of the walls in the maze. Tap each space one at a time to highlight the path you want to take. If you make a misstep, a misstep, you can you could deselect that space by tapping it again. Hint number one. Working backward from the goal in your head is a great tactic that could help you find the answer. Hint number two. The solution requires that you take exactly 19 steps from the start point to the goal. Hint number three. From the start point, begin your walk by taking a step to the right. The solution uh, should look a little bit like this. You got to tap them one at a time, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. Uh, go up here. I like that little noise it makes when you do the little tapping. And there you go. This should do the trick. Good old Smiling Layton, and as you saw before when we got the puzzle Wonderful. wrong real quick, uh, it showed a Frowning Layton right before it revealed whether or not it was true, so it's kind of like a, this game's equivalent of the music either going silent or continue playing in Phoenix Wright. Well, Keller, me surprised. You've got quite the noodle under that hat, don't you? Okay, bye, creepy lady. Uh, we can go into our room right now if we want to. Doesn't seem like there's anything for us, and since we're on an investigation now, we can't really rest here. So let's see if we go to the back. Oh man, I am dog food! What's the matter, mister? What? Oh hey! Okay, so I snuck into my uncle's room and borrowed his camera, right? The thing is, then I dropped it! I've been here trying to find all the pieces for like an hour, but I've only found one piece. That's quite a predicament. Yeah, if word gets out about this wrecked camera, I'm gonna be major flag from the boss man. Whoa, brain flashing coming! Dig this, I'm gonna give you this busted hunk of junk. You do with it what you want, just get rid of this thing, will ya? Okay, catch you on the flip side, whippy dip. What? Hey, come back ya! The camera minigame has been added to the trunk. Use the squarish part. You got the squarish part. Use it to rebuild the camera in the professor's trunk. So once again, it's another minigame for you, and I will be doing it all in one fell swoop once we get all the pieces. You typically pe get pieces for completing puzzles. Uh, we still can't go back there, which is kind of annoying. How Sammy Thunder... Uh... Your pal Sammy Thunder has a puzzle that'll take your mind off of that door. Check it. Okay, even though we didn't have the explanation point, we still have a puzzle. Puzzle number 19, the train ride. An unknown number of people are riding a train. At the first section, at the first station, the train pulls into. One-sixth of the people on board get off. At the next section, station, whatever, one-fifth of the remaining passengers get off. This pattern continues so that the next station's one-fourth get off, and then one-third get off, and then one-half. Then at the final station, all passengers remaining on the train exit as well. Assuming no one got on the train during the ride, what is the fewest number of people that could have been riding on the train when it got out, when it set out? Hint number one. Since the puzzle tells you that no one got on the train during the ride, it's safe to say that the number of passengers on the train never increased. Hint number two. Since one-sixth of the passengers get off at the first station, you know the number must be divisible by six. Start by choosing a number that's divisible by 6 and see what happens. The principle by which this puzzle is solved should become evident soon. Hint number 3. Imagine that 30 passengers are on the train where it embarks. At the first station, the train loses one-sixth of its passengers, meaning 5 people get off. At the train station, at the next station, one-fifth of those remaining, or 5 people, get off. At the next station, one-fourth of those remaining, or 5 more people, get off. You know, do you notice a pattern here? 
a whole lot of fives, but the answer is not five. The answer is six. Just leave it to me. Piece of cake. So basically only one person's getting off every at every station. And that's how that one goes. Well, now show's over, so move it, will ya? If folks in there find another passenger hanging around outside their door, I'm gonna get an earful. So we still can't make it in the back of that car, which is kind of unfortunate, but um, maybe we won't need to go back there, or maybe we will, and we'll get there in due time. All I need to, all I know is I need to get better at spacing out these episode lengths. So we're gonna end this off right here. Next time on Professor Layton in the Diabolical Box, we'll continue our search for Tom, as well as our own personal investigation of the Elysium Box. This is Midnight and Beyond, and I will see you all later. Good night. Did I just say good night? I never say good night. I think that's like the first time I've ever said that in Let's Play in history. That was a complete accident, and I don't know what came over me. I apologize for that scandalous vocabulary right there. Thank you.